Dysphagia after a stroke. How swallowing is impacted by stroke location. In this video, I'm going to focus on one particular impairment that makes a lot of medical professionals sweat. Dysphagia. Stick around to learn about different parts of the brain and their role in swallowing and how we can use this information to advocate for instrumental swallow studies. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. So right versus left hemisphere. As with most research, literature is varied on this topic. Several studies have suggested differences in swallow patterns based on lesion lateralization alone, or which hemisphere of the brain the stroke is located. Others, however, suggest that there is no difference between hemispheres. These findings might be all over the place for a lot of different reasons. This includes the differences in research methods, patient selection, and even definitions and measures of various swallow impairments. That being said, let's see what researchers have suggested when it comes to identifying differences between right and left hemisphere damage and associated swallowing symptoms. So which is worse when it comes to swallowing impairments and stroke, damage in the right or the left hemisphere? A 2018 study found that pharyngeal impairment is more likely to be worse after a right-sided stroke. More specifically, they found worse overall laryngeal vestibular closure, worse timing and speed measure, and worse penetration aspiration scores. They did not find any differences in oral swallow functions between right and left hemisphere strokes. A bit more recent study in 2019 by Wilmsketter and colleagues titled Mapping Acute Lesion Locations to Physiological Swallow Impairments After a Stroke found that overall right hemisphere is linked to pharyngeal dysphagia or more severe dysphagia symptoms in general. However, that being said, they also found that anterior hyoid movement and laryngeal vestibular closure deficits were associated with stroke lesions in the left hemisphere. So the take home message, while there's no hard and fast rule for 100% of the patients you see, you can at least expect a higher incidence of dysphagia in patients with a right-sided stroke. I've always been really confused by this stuff too, thinking someone has got to create a map for us with the exact impairments for each lesion site. Why isn't anyone creating this yet? And well, come to find out because it truly isn't that simple. We can make hypotheses about certain areas, but it's much more complex than just, if A is affected, then it means B. So that's the hemispheres, but what about specific locations in the brain and their impact on swallowing? Can we make predictions off of that? As you might expect, you'll find variable research on this topic as well. However, pulling from that same 2019 article I mentioned above, dedicated to mapping acute stroke lesion locations to swallow impairments, there are some impairments you can more likely predict based on site of lesion. Here's a quick overview of what you might find. If you have a patient with a stroke in the insula, you should consider the increased likelihood of impaired timing and synchronization of swallowing events. Airway protection during the swallow may also be impacted. Lesions in the supramarginal gyrus could lead to impaired laryngeal vestibular closure and pharyngeal residue. Impaired laryngeal elevation could be associated with inferior frontal gyrus lesions. Stroke in the thalamus? Consider the anterior hyoid excursion. It might be reduced. Maybe you have a patient with white matter lesions, like in the corona radiata. Lesions here have been associated with impaired oral intake, laryngeal elevation, laryngeal vestibular closure, and pharyngeal residue. I think as a clinician working somewhere with limited access to instrumentation, this is all really important because this can help us to justify instrumentals to our administrators just by having these initial hypotheses of impairments. We aren't able to identify any of these impairments at the bedside, so it really is imperative to get an instrumental assessment to confirm these findings and make the best treatment plan for our patients. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't wanna miss, so make sure to hit that like or subscribe button, leave a comment, or turn on the notification bell. So why should SLPs and doctors care? Up to 78% of all stroke survivors experience swallowing difficulty. 
With the growth of our aging population, we're seeing a rise in the incidence of stroke, thus a rise in the incidence of dysphagia. We're also seeing an increase in the survival rates of patients because of the advances of TPNs, which means just more patients for us to see. Not all dysphagia symptoms are the same. However, an understanding when oral dysphagia versus pharyngeal dysphagia versus silent aspiration is more likely to occur based on the location and severity of the stroke can help SLPs better advocate for instrumental swallowing assessments. I always say that the reason I love doing instrumental assessments is that I'm never surprised by what I find because I'm always surprised at what I find. Becoming a good dysphagia detective is important through understanding neuroanatomy and clinical signs, but it just doesn't compare to actually visualizing the swallow and what the patient is capable of achieving. I've done many studies where I assume this patient must be aspirating everything. There's no way they can't be. They end up swallowing beautifully. On the flip side, I've had little old Sally tell me her swallow is just perfect. I make my clinical hypotheses and it's all confirmed. She's aspirating everything. So I know as SLPs, we know these things, but really putting on our dysphagia detective hat and explaining the underlying neuroanatomy goes a long way to our administrators and physician colleagues for gaining respect and referrals. For more information and editorial reviewed resources about this topic, join this MedSLP movement and enroll in the MedSLP Collective today.